We got a great interview for you guys today on TYT Interviews. This is Todd Stiefel. He is uh, the founder and president of Stiefel Free Thought Foundation. Uh, that is one of the leading atheist groups in the country. And uh, you've put a lot of money actually into not just your organization, but Secular Coalition for America, American Humanist Association, America's United for Separation of Church and State, to which I say, ironically, God bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, great And to also to you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Todd, uh, let's uh, talk about how you grew up first. And I, mm -hmm. I want to find out like how you got to be who you are, and then we'll talk about what you're doing in terms of the organizations and the atheist movement, etc. So, uh, were you uh, born into no religion, or you had a religion? I was born an atheist like we all are, and then learned Catholicism. <laughs> I see, that's a good way of putting it. Okay. And was raised a Catholic, a liberal Catholic. My parents mostly set me to learn values and to get an education in religion and the like. But I mean, I went through the whole thing. Catholic high school, I used to wear a cross around my neck, prayed, felt the spirit, went on religious retreats, the whole works. Oh really, even oh, yeah. religious retreats? Yes. So did they you ever intense. shake in anything or no? No, but I, I, re I distinctly remember one in high school called The Encounter, mm -hmm. which... That sounds kind of scary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you go in, to a Catholic retreat and you get The Encounter. <laughs> in, in, in hindsight, it kind of was because, I mean, I remember it being very moving and very emotional. But then I was in a psychology class in college and we we're learning about brainwashing techniques and they start talking about keeping you hungry. I was like, wait, I was hungry that whole weekend. And they kept us up really late at night and woke us up really early in the morning. And then they had us talk about our most vulnerable moments and really painful memories and then helped fill the gap with Jesus and the like. And it's like, so that's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so there's two things about that. Uh, you know, I've heard people describe uh, uh, retreats like Buddhist retreats. Mm -hmm. And I anger a lot of people by also being against Buddhism. Like they feel like that's the one peaceful God bless religion and like everybody's in harmony, which is of course nonsense, right? <laughs> Uh, now, Japanese in World War II were Buddhists. Yeah, okay, <laughs> point number one, right? <laughs> Rape of Nanking, not as peaceful as you might uh, imagine. Of course, there's in present day some South Asian countries where Buddhists are doing tremendous violence against Muslims, yes. which is fascinating. But anyway, th in the retreats, what they do is same thing, hungry, go up and down the steps, up and down these steps, et cetera, repetition. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking like, and then you start to have visions. I'm like, hey, yeah, you're having visions because they've put you in this incredible stressful environment where, you're, where they, your brain starts playing tricks on you. It's not that God reached out to you, it's that they're brainwashing you, like, like you said. Yeah, I, I don't think they actually mean to do that. I just think those were the memes and techniques that evolved because they worked. These were effective at persuading people, so that's what they use. I don't think it's anything hostile or intentionally negative, but in hindsight, it, it, it is what it is, and it was effective. It worked on me for a while. Yeah, that's interesting, super interesting. So um, w when you say you felt the spirit, like, did you think like, did you, uh, did you feel it? What does that mean, feel it? I felt a rush of neurotransmitters released in my mind that simulated a <laughs> spiritual experience. Right. <laughs> God, they're gonna, the religious folks are gonna hate us. <laughs> Breaking it down like this. T technically, but I did feel a I mean, what I think many religions say is their spiritual experience. I felt uplifted. I felt a, a surge of emotion. I felt connected to the people around me and to the universe or God or whatever different people ascribe it to. At that time, I felt, you know, I didn't necessarily feel I was talking to God, I, but I did feel some sort of emotional connectivity, if you will. Right, and, and another thing you mentioned there is something that another friend of mine who was Christian went to a retreat, et cetera, and what they kept asking him is, uh, okay, so what, like, you got a problem with your love life? He's like, no. Uh, with your friends? No. With your, like, they're looking for the hole in your heart that Jesus is gonna fill, mm -hmm. right? And that seems, that feels really, like, certainly feels like they're exploiting you, let me put it that way. Yeah, I was actually reading about a, pre a preacher in North Carolina, where I'm from, who is a former NFL player who goes into schools and tries to preach to the kids in the schools. And he's taught, they, I heard him do an interview to talk about the separation of church and state and how does he, how does he you know, bring Jesus to these kids. He's like, oh, well, you know, we're not allowed to bring it up. I just start asking them how they hurt and what's wrong in their lives. And sooner or later, it gives me the opportunity to bring Jesus to them. Mm -hmm. It's like, Ah, you know, so you're, you're pushing, trying to find the pain points, and then you in turn try to fill the gap, which... God, it feels so sleazy in a way. 
right? I, I mean, it does to me at least. And by the way, it's of course it's not just Christians. I mean, how do they get the suicide bombers, right? Mm -hmm. What's missing in your life? Oh, Allah has the answer, etc. And somehow it all winds up in a fiery explosion, and that was the answer. Which is not a great answer. Well, with like with this preacher, like it feels dirty to me, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I know to him he means well. I'm sure in his heart he really feels like he's doing the right thing. So I can empathize with him and I don't dislike him. I think he's in, in his mind trying to do the right thing and trying to really help people. And for that, I applaud him. I do disagree with the methods though. I do think he's violating <laughs> the constitution and getting special access he shouldn't get. And I think it would be much better to try to persuade people based on the merits of your argument rather than on their emotional vulnerabilities. And, and Todd, look, that's a really enlightened way of looking at it. And I think you're right about that. And don't get me wrong, a lot of people do have problems in X, Y, or Z parts of their lives. And that's why religion is so successful because it gives them a little bit of hope. And there's mm -hmm. value in that, right? And it makes them think, okay, well, Jesus loves me. Somebody loves me. And it's mm -hmm. Jesus, right? And maybe my life is not so good now. Uh, but you know, but in the afterlife it's going to get better and everybody needs hope. It's a powerful, powerful drug right. and, and it's sometimes the drug can be used in a bad way. Oh, don't do anything in, your, in this life. Don't worry. You take the bad situation you're in because afterwards you'll get a lovely life. The poor get the best life up there. Yeah, right. yeah. Don't do anything about it. But sometimes it could be a helpful drug where it inspires you into exactly. action, etc. So, yeah, and my problem with religion isn't any of that. My problem is that I just don't think it's true. Exactly. I'm not one of those who thinks religion is all evil and it's absolutely horrible, don't give it an inch. I am more in the camp of it's, I think it's a net negative in the world. But I think for most individuals at that personal level, it's, it's probably a positive for most people. It's when you add it up that you start getting into a lot of the challenges and the consequences. And probably one of the biggest ones is what you were alluding to a moment ago. It's that, that taking away the accountability. It's don't worry, it, you'll have this afterlife. You, you will get forgiveness. You, there's, the consequences are all after you're dead, which kind of removes all measurable consequences that right. one could prove or disprove. Yeah, when you get to the particular parts of the different religions, then it gets really twisted. I mean, in Christianity, you have this concept of forgiveness. I can do all the horrible things in the world, and like a minute before I die, oh, Jesus, hey, there you are. <laughs> okay, and everything's fine. That's perverse, you know, incentive yes, systems exactly. to say the least. And, and different religions have different mm -hmm. ways of dealing with that. That have positives and negatives. But so you're brought up in this atmosphere mm -hmm. and in this context. How do you break out of it? When did you start to question it? And, and what happened after that? I learned about the Bible. It's okay. it's a great tool to turn people into atheists, actually. <laughs> but same thing for me, by the way. I read I, same thing. I read the Quran, then I read the Bible, and I was like, oh Jesus, literally. Oh, like, this is, <laughs> oh. This, oh, this is not it says real. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that can't be true. Well, because in, in Catholic school, th they taught us about the Bible and religion, but there was a whole lot of it they just kind of glossed over. It was more about the love and peace and happiness, and, and that's great. Those are the positive teachings of religion, and there are some great things in the Bible, but there's some horrible atrocities in there as well. So when I was in college, I took a class in Old Testament history, and that's when I started seeing the things I hadn't seen before, but also learned about the cultural evolution of this. It's like when you start to think about it in terms of, okay, Yahweh is younger than the pyramids by thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So are the that pyramids puts, the gods of Yahweh? They, <laughs> Wait a woo. minute. Or the aliens that were in the pyramids. All right. Yeah, it was the Masons who were in the pyramids. That <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw a movie like that. <laughs> the giant Prometheus guy? No. All right. Uh, so yeah, obviously factual uh, problems uh, begin to arise. Exactly. But, but when did it, let me ask you this, what, what was your tipping point where you thought, uh, I've had enough, I, I don't think this is right? It, it, that was really it right there, was when I realized that there were many ancient gods in the Middle East. This was just one of many, but this God's followers won out many times through war, also just through innovations, being intolerant of other gods and saying, we're going to have one God. But just seeing in there that there was many gods in the Bible itself, just like, wow, this was just a polytheistic religion that evolved to be monotheistic. It's really similar 
in many ways to how other religions evolve too. It's just a cultural phenomenon. It's really not that different than Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or anything else. And it, when I turned to look at my own religion the same way I looked at other religions, it, the mystique just disappeared and it faded away. And at that point I considered myself an agnostic and yeah. later on just realized I was also an atheist. Right. It's, it's funny, the, the, we went through the same evolution, if you will, and I remember reading the Old Testament, there was a part in it where, um, first of all, there's all these different gods, as you point out, and I'm like, wait a minute, it's as if they are hiding the truth in plain sight. Mm -hmm. If anyone actually read the Bible, they would realize that the propaganda that taught about the Bible, not just the negative stuff, the anti-gay stuff, but even the positive stuff, is not really all there is in the Bible. There's a lot of other stuff that's insane. So first of all, in one section of the Bible, the God of the, of the Jews loses to another God. And I was like, wait a minute, why aren't we praying to that God? <laughs> I'm like, that was like, that blew my mind, right? Yeah, but Yahweh gets equal in the sequel, I think. Oh, is that right, the, re yeah. the revenge of Yahweh? Yeah. Yahweh strikes back? Okay. <laughs> so, and I'm like, okay, wait, that's incredibly weird. And another uh, part, Yahweh helps them trick the other Canaanites or whoever mm -hmm. they are, and they, they have them all do circumcisions so that they can have sex with their women. Like they say, okay, we're gonna let you have sex with our daughters as long as you all do circumcisions. As soon as they do circumcisions, they're all in tremendous pain, they go and slaughter them all, <laughs> okay? And I'm like, wait, 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 which ones were the good guys again? Wait, we're on the side of the guys who did the slaughtering with the circumcision trick? I'm like, why are we on their side? And so, it, 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 for my purposes, the same thing with you. I say, if you wanna it, read the Bible, I almost wanna get those exact same bu bumper stickers that Christians have, read the Bible. Well, it, it, this reminds me of something, like just a new piece of activism we're doing. So, something that came up a while ago, but is just coming to fruition. I, I talked to Dave Silverman, American Atheist, a while back. I was like, I would love to counter one of these Ten Commandment displays with the punishments of, for the Ten Commandments and educate people on the difference between the Ten Commandments and, for example, the Bill of Rights. Because you get all these Christian nationalists and dominionists who are like, this is a Christian nation, we're founded on Christian law and principles. Hogwash. It's complete hogwash. Yeah. It's the exact opposite, actually. We're the first secular country in the world. <laughs> exactly. So this actually finally is c coming to pass. The right opportunity came up. There was a, a Bradford County in Florida ended up with a privately financed Ten Commandments display on public property mm -hmm. and would not remove it. So this creates an open public forum and we called their bluff. We said, okay, we'll put up a monument too. So we just announced today actually that my foundation's funding American Atheists who's doing all the, the hard work on it behind the scenes and we're gonna put up our own monument. And it's gonna be a stone to monument and it's gonna list the punishments of every Ten Commandment right on there, which is death, 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 death. Like, you know, we've, got, awesome. we've, got the first, we've got the First Amendment, you get freedom of religion. Ten Commandments, death if you don't believe in Yahweh. We've got the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Ten Commandments, death if you blaspheme. So blasphemy equals death, America, we don't have that. Pretty clear, I'm pretty sure about contrast. 98% of the country would be dead if on oh, blasphemy yeah. alone. H how about Le working on Sundays? How about That's the death penalty too, by the way. Working on us on the Sabbath is the death penalty. You we lose the entire NFL. Oh God! Or, or obliterated, <laughs> and they uh. touch pigskin. Oh, they're in a world of hurt, right? Uh, and then uh, you know, covet thy neighbor's wife. <laughs> there goes another fifty percent of the country. Uh, absolutely. Okay. So and and so I love that project. David Silverman is he the guy that uh, would debate with O'Reilly? The, the he sat a few moments with O'Reilly. The tides yes. go in, the tides, tides go out. out. You, you can't explain that. That's <laughs> like, are you kidding me? That he's guy's got a that hero. that priceless look like. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I want to get to your activism. Uh, sure. First, I, I got to do a bridge here. So, uh, you know, you give a lot of money to these organizations, which is awesome. So I got to ask, how'd you get the money? My family had a pharmaceutical industry. And when I was a kid, it was pretty small. It was specializing in dermatology. And it, it grew a lot. And then when I got out of college, I ended up going to work there. I actually worked there and doing summer internships as well. And then it just boomed. In the 12 years I was there, we grew revenues by about 4x and ended up in a really large, successful company and then kind of got surprised. We got an offer out of the blue and uh, ended up selling the business and kind of wasn't planning on that and found myself synergized, if you will. Uh -huh. <laughs> We'd acquired a, a couple of companies and you know those usually end up with 
people being let go because you end up with too many people on hand. And the same happened to me, which I kind of thought was delicious irony. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> and funny. So I had to, I had to, to decide, like, what do I, what do I want to do? And, and do I go back into pharmaceuticals? I mean, at first I was actually hoping to work for the company that acquired us, but that, that didn't end up happening. And so I followed the advice I got from a number of people. The consistent advice I got was do something you love, do something you're passionate about. And you know, gaining respect for free thinkers and ensuring civil liberties for all of us and making sure church and state are separate is something I'm really passionate about. I saw this as kind of the next great civil equality movement. In many ways we have our rights as free thinkers. We are protected by the Civil Rights Act, but we don't necessarily have civil equality on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a lot of discrimination out there. To me, you know, look, it's so out of the box if for so many people that they, you know, they wouldn't think, okay, how am I going to spend a lot of this money in a way that isn't going to make more money? It's actually just going out the door, but it's to help people in your community and, and to spread free thinking to, to everybody, right? Um, uh, but at the same time, I feel like it's almost a no-brainer. Like, you've got all this money, why in the world would you go work for GlaxoSmithKline? What are you like, why did you even consider that? I mean, I I'd be like, I... oh wait, and then so you got a boss and that boss is gonna tell you what to do? Be like, dude, I, I, I don't know if you know how much our company got bought for, it, so it, step back. I, I, I very well might have taken that position. I, I liked it. I, I enjoyed pharma. I liked getting to work with my family. It was a blast. Yeah, well, bless your heart on that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you want, we can put you to work here, man. We got right. plenty of work. I'll, I'll help do some post editing for you. <laughs> okay, yeah, we could use it. So, uh, talk to me about uh, first of all your foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what do you want to accomplish with it, and what does it do specifically? So, I mean, the foundation really is just me. It, it's I put the money into that when the year I got it, mostly for, frankly, the simplistic reason of, of tax is we sold the business, there's a lot of money that comes in at the same time. It makes sense to give away a lot of money the same year for tax purposes. So oh, that I was sense. planning on giving it away, a lot of money away anyway. And when I looked but at you, it, when I looked actually... at it and it talked to the tax experts, do you give it away over time? Well, that's what I want to do. Well, I found a way to give it away over time and up front. So I gave it to my foundation so I could then give it away over time rather than just dumping it all in one shot. And I'll make up numbers here, but because of tax reasons, if you put in the $10 million, uh, when the sale happens, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it, if you had put it in afterwards, you could only put in $7 million or $6 million. Yeah, You see I, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, so you get to actually give more by doing a pre-tax. You can give a lot more money. Right. It, it becomes a greatly more efficient. Right. All right. Once again, ironically, God bless. Okay, that makes sense. I'm very blessed today. <laughs> yes, Thank you. Yes, you are. Ironically, it doesn't count at all. <laughs> I keep blessing you. And I feel to good. No I feel good. Okay, all right. So, um, so what do you, what, how do you spend the money? Let's put it that way. I, I try to invest it in ideas that I either hear about that I like or ideas I have. One of the things... I like as if I have an idea I like, I try to bounce it off people in the movement, whichever group I think would be best able to execute on that idea. And sometimes they're like, yeah, that's not such a good idea. Okay, fine, mm -hmm. move along. You know, you throw a lot of ideas against the wall and see what sticks. And sometimes like, wow, that's a great idea. And I'll usually either help finance it and provide strategy for it and they go do it. Or maybe we'll f try to see if we could find some other donors to help get involved and make it happen. But my days are spent advising groups in the movement, coming up ideas, funding them, and you know, just trying to get the message out there, trying to help people understand what, what this is about and, and why we should all just love each other. You, know, you mentioned before kind of sp the concept of spreading free thought. You know, I'm, I'm all for spreading that to people who are questioning their faith and people who aren't sure and presenting it as an option. But I'm not really one to try to deconvert people. I, I have no interest in deconversions. If somebody's happy where they are, so be it. I just want people to question, and, and don't be a fundamentalist. If you want to be religious, great, awesome, that's wonderful. My, my wife's a Christian, love her. That, that's totally fine, fine with me. I, I, I want to work. Do your kids go to church? They used to sometimes, yeah. Uh-huh, okay, yeah. that's trippy. There's some stories there, too. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I guess to me, I want to work with the religious people. To gain respect for free thinkers, I don't need to gain respect from other atheists. We don't need to gain respect from each other. It's the people in the religious community who we have to show who we are. We have to come out of the closet and say, hey, we're here. We, we believe many things. We don't believe exactly like you do, but a lot of our values we share. 
Mm -hmm. we, we believe in love, we believe in integrity, we believe in freedom and democracy. We share many, many things in common w with most religious people. It, the people, ironically, that should be kind of considered the outsiders are not the people who are not religious, it's the religious extreme, extremists of the world. Those are the people whose values differ from both the reli regular religious people and the free thinkers. So yeah, so it's interesting because we agree at least on 66% of stuff. I go a little further than you, but... Radical. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I was just about to write an editorial on this called It's the, it's the Fundamentals of Stupid, right? And so it's not that we got a war on Islam and oh my god, all the Muslims are dangerous. We got a, over a billion Muslims in the world and 99.99999% of them are not dangerous, are not bad, are not coming to get us, etc. Who are the ones in that 0.01% that's coming to get us? The fundamentalists, right? And so, and, and who are the people causing problems in this country, trying to take away people's rights, mm -hmm. encouraging more wars? Literally, the fundamentalists here uh, were, are pressuring our government, they did it under Bush, they're doing it under Obama, to not have a peace deal in Israel. Right? Because of biblical prophecy, etc. So it's not, the problem isn't Christians, the problem isn't Muslims. And by the way, in the Middle East, of course, then you've got the fundamentalist Jews who are like, no, 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 this is my land. Right. Yahweh gave it to me 2,000 years ago, sad day for you. I don't care about you or your <laughs> rights. I don't even count you as a person because you, you're not in the Yahweh camp and we got this cool little camp we right. got going here. Etc. So it's the fundamentalism, stupid. So I agree with you totally on that. I would go further, I would evangelize. Okay, but, but you're right that it's really important to draw a line on being obnoxious. Not like, ha ha, you're wrong, and right. I don't want to take, I don't, and to me, I don't want to take away people's faith. I don't even know if we're, like, I, I don't, and that's why I call myself agnostic. I don't make a claim on what's right and wrong in terms of order versus chaos in the mm. universe. Like, I don't have the formula on that, right? But all I want to do is tell people to read the Bible. Right, and to read right. their religious texts because I like I want to tell them, look, it's not the propaganda you got taught is it true? Okay, you really need to understand what the reality of religion is, and that Christianity was formed not when Jesus was around, but three to four hundred years later by Constantine in an incredibly political mm -hmm. gathering, it's etc. So, am, am I wrong about that? Or no, I I think you're right. I mean, I think we're you you get in the danger is the fundamentalism and where I think religion differs from fundamentalist religion is the first step is you stop questioning. You outsource your morality, if you will, to some sacred text or some holy man who tells you what to do. And it's always a whole holy man, just about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so, he always wants to have sex with your wife. Of course. That's so <laughs> you, you, you're outsourcing your morality. The next step is I have the one true truth. Everyone else is wrong. And then the final step is when you get to the, the ends justify the means. It's, yeah. I have the one true truth and killing is worthwhile to make sure everyone else believes it because you know, it's really an ultimate good to spread my beliefs and if I have to kill to do that, that's okay. As a matter of fact, that's holy. That gets me 72 virgins, sweet. So that's where I think the real problems are. And, and the path there is that failing to question. So. Mm -hmm. All I ask of religious people is, is keep questioning, keep that doubt. I know, I know religious people have doubts, so everyone does. Just keep asking those questions, believe, believe whatever you want to believe. That's, that's not my business. Right, and we can't get too fundamentalists ourselves in the mm -hmm. free thinking community. Agreed. Because that's why I say I don't have the answer. I, I mean, uh, uh, E equals MC squared, I guess it could have equaled, equal, could have equaled <laughs> MC cubed. I don't know why that happened, <laughs> right? I don't have the answer why, of, of why we have this particular mm -hmm. order. So let's not be arrogant in terms of, of like we've got the whole universe figured out. It's just a matter of, I don't know what's right. I do know what's wrong, right? I do know like that two plus two does not equal five on this planet, right? I don't know why it equals four, but I know it doesn't equal five. It, it's this concept of being willing to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you can say, I don't know, you can inoculate yourself from so many false beliefs and so many past that can lead you down very negative moral r roots and catastrophic repercussions. If people can just say, I don't know, and really probe, that'll help everyone. All right, last thing. What, what are the, the two or three priorities you're working on now that you, you think are really important? All right, so one thing I'm really excited about is we're in year two of the Foundation Beyond Belief effort to raise money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So, oh, that's great. So what, last year was our first year, and we organized about 
think we have about 20 allies from across humanism, atheism, almost all the major groups joined us in helping recruit teams, recruit people. And we ended up with 150 local level teams across the country, raised $400,000. We broke their all time record for first year fundraising and we were their fourth largest team overall. So awesome first year. So we are doing it again this year and we're trying to turn it into to a tradition. So hopefully everybody will go out to uh, fbbls.org and check it out and join the team. Too many letters, but I hear you. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> just say just it look one more day. fbbls.org. That's Foundation Beyond Belief, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society.org. All right, that's Not the ideal URL. If you just go to Foundation Beyond Belief, you'll find it too. Uh, I come to think of it, I'm going to cheat as usual. One, one more question. Uh, you know, 14% of the country at least now are non-believers, right? Mm -hmm. That's larger than the African American population in this country. I believe larger than the Latino population in this country. Yeah, it yeah, is, well. but but in terms of political power, it is by far the least represented Absolutely. minority in the country. Yes. So uh, let me ask a broad final question: How do we fix that? We need to do a lot of things to fix that. <laughs> That's yeah. not a short answer, unfortunately. <laughs> right. So. Uh, frankly, the number one thing is we need to take a page out of the LGBT playbook. We need to come out. We need to be open, honest about our beliefs, show who we are on a day-to-day -day basis. Get out in our communities, do community service, express who we are. People need to know we're out there. They need to know we're moral, ethical, we're their friends, we're their neighbors. That's the first and foremost thing. Then we need to organize. We need people to get involved with organizations within the movement. We need people to get involved in lobbying. We've got an organization, the Secular Coalition for America, that lobbies on our behalf in DC and is starting chapters to lobby at the state level across the country. We need people to get involved. We need money. We need people to donate. We are outgunned massively on a dollar for dollar scale versus the, the religious right. We frankly need to be out open and involved. We need people to see us for who we are and as nice, kind, decent people. And eventually the politicians are finally starting to notice. It, 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 an interesting, uh, very interesting piece. I was at a religion news writers association conference a year ago and they were taught right before the election and they had a couple political scientists up there who are experts in the intersection of politics and religion. And they asked one of them, who is the most important dem re religious demographic in this election? Without missing B says, the nuns. It's 20% of this country now, according to the most recent data, it's about 30% of people under the age of 30. Obama absolutely has to win the nuns, but it's currently a political third rail. He's got to figure out a way to win the nuns without people realizing he's trying to win the nuns. So I did a story, <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. I did a story about that on the Young Turks, and, uh, and he did. He won over 70% of their vote, and it was critical. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is, same thing with Latinos, they're right around 13% of the population. Yeah, depending, depending on how you characterize the nuns, they range from 14 to 20%, as you're mm -hmm. pointing out. So larger than Latinos, but Latinos voted 71% in favor of Obama, and everybody is talking about, oh, that's it, Republicans have to give in to the Latinos, it's over, give them what they want, it's politically untenable to be against uh, the Latino community. Whereas Obama won, I think, almost three quarters of the nuns, and they have no political power. None, right? And so, but you know, that's why I love having these conversations because something you said there sparked it. I mean, the minute you said we have to copy the LGBT community, I thought, absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's already over. We can stop taping now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we have the plan, it's over. Because it's not just uh, coming out, which is great and brilliant, right? Uh, and, and getting active, et cetera. But it's also using, look, the reality of, of American politics is that it's run on money. And the LGBT community recognize that. Mm -hmm. The most important number is not what percentage you are in the general population, it's what percentage you are in the donor base. And when Obama had trouble raising money from Wall Street, he turned to the LGBT community and they became a significant chunk, I believe 20% of his top bundlers, the ones who bundle even more money together. And immediate, all of a sudden, Obama had an evolution. He, he's like, oh, my opinions on gay marriage have evolved. Funny how that works. It's funny how that works. <laughs> and from then on, it has been nothing but victory after political victory for the LGBT community, which is great, because we're progressives, we agree with that, or I, I know I do. Um, but so why don't you copy that? Right? And now look, some people can't because they don't have the money, right? But you they know They can volunteer. Right. They can go out and vote. 
They can say they are, who they are. They can talk to their friends. They can express what the problems are with the agenda of the religious right and why our points are actually helpful to all Americans, religious and otherwise. Right, and, uh, and, and, and the reality is among that 20%, there's a whole lot of rich folks too. They just mm -hmm. don't vote with their either with their vote literal votes or with their money with their donations in that direction for example uh, I believe Peter Thiel who is mm -hmm. a massive libertarian uh, conservative gives a ton of money well libertarian to be fair right gives a ton of money uh, to political do, uh, groups but doesn't give it based on on his religious beliefs and so he winds up giving to Republicans who are against his religious beliefs and he should at least insist if you're going to take my money at least you should do this. I mean, look, when you buy politicians, at least you get your money's worth usually. Right? I mean, keeping it real. Well, this is the whole other side of the equation, which is the longer term strategies of the reality is, is we have to do a better job providing a lot of the services that religion has traditionally provided, whether it be communities or charitable services or other ways of just connecting with one another and working together. Because if you identify as, well, I'm just not religious, there's no there's nothing to work for there. But if you're, I'm a humanist, I believe in humanist values, or I'm an agnostic, and I, these are the things I believe in. It, it, when you realize that there's more to being non-religious than just tossing aside religion, there's a whole set of values that you can put yourself towards and work towards that align with politics, that's where you can put your money behind your values and your time behind your values and really make a difference in this country. Yeah, and I love how O'Reilly from time to time on the air will say, secular humanist. <laughs> and I've always like thought that was the funniest thing. Like I, I grew, being Turkish, I grew up you know, really valuing secular. Uh -huh. I'm like, I don't understand what the problem with that is. And then humanism, like, we're fa in favor of human beings. I got news for you, Bill O'Reilly, you're also a human being. <laughs> Okay. I mean, they're goofballs. But hey, listen, you're putting your money where your mouth is and you're leading the fight. So Todd Stiefel, Stiefel Free Thought Foundation, thank you so much for Thanks joining us. Thanks for having us. me on the show. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it.